Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the safeguarding freedom of the press, the role of uh, international law. Um, welcome to you all in the room, but welcome also to those joining us um, virtually from all around um, the world. Two short housekeeping matters. The first is that um, if we have time for questions, we would absolutely love to hear from you. I'm told that questions have to be submitted to the app and will appear magically before me. Um, so we encourage you to submit your questions. Secondly, if you would like to claim your CLE, please do check in at the start of the session. Please find someone from ASIL who will have a, um, see at the very back, um, uh, uh, a white ribbon and you'll have to check out um, as, as well. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will all um, join me um, uh, in um, expressing the great admiration upon hearing um, from Ambassador uh, Mark Arova. It was humbling and moving in equal measure to listen to her, to see, of course, these past um, 40 or so days, the people of Ukraine stand firm for democracy and to stand firm for freedom in the face of Mr. Putin's uh, aggression. Of course, neither democracy nor freedom could meaningfully exist without freedom of expression or absent a free, independent, and fact-based press, which brings us to our subject today. Today, the free press and independent journalists are under attack all over the world like never before. This comes as authoritarian regimes make every effort to suppress the free flow of information so as to control what constitutes the truth itself. The Nobel Committee chose last year to award its Peace Prize to two remarkable journalists, my friend and client Maria Ressa from the Philippines, who you will hear from later today, and of course Dmitry Muratov from Russia. Since that award, the attacks on Maria have not stopped. Dmitry Muratov's Novaya Gazeta has had to suspend publication. All the while, disinformation is spreading like a plague. The question that arises, one of the questions that arise for us as international lawyers, is what role international law plays or ought to play in safeguarding freedom of the press in what is clearly a moment of acute crisis. And that question arises in circumstances where the freedom of expression is enshrined as a right in international law, protected by treaty, set out the international uh, covenant amongst all other regional human rights treaties. But that right needs to be seen against a practical reality a practical reality whereby that right is being violated more now than ever before. What we're going to discuss today is several aspects of this issue, and we're going to approach it from multiple perspectives. A part of our focus will be on the work of a new, on the work of a new multilateral international state initiative the Media Freedom Coalition, a coalition of just over 50 states currently co-chaired by Canada and the Netherlands. Those, st those states have in turn established an independent high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom, chaired by Lord Newberger of Abbotsbury, the former president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. I serve as one of two deputies to that panel, and I'm delighted to have join us today 
um, my fellow panel members, Hina Jelani on my right, Dario Milo on my far right, and Karuna Nundi, my immediate left. I'm also um, extremely pleased that we're joined today by Jeffrey Marder from Global Affairs Canada, to the right of Hina Jelani, and to my very left, David McGraw from the New York Times. I want to start, Jeffrey, with a question uh, to you. Could you tell us a little bit more, please, about this Media Freedom um, Coalition, why it was created, what it seeks to achieve? Okay, I would be happy to, and, and thanks, uh, Jan. So picking up a little bit, you sort of uh, sketched out the beginnings of it. It is what um, I like to call a multi-stakeholder thematic coalition focused on media freedom. It was established uh, two years, three years ago, almost in July of 2019, at the initiative of Canada and the United Kingdom, um, uh, and announced its creation uh, in London at the first global, global conference for media freedom. Um, it now comprises at the state level 52 uh, member countries who have each taken a global pledge on media freedom, which is, which is a commitment to um, improve media freedom domestically in, in each of uh, the countries, but also to work together internationally uh, to improve media freedom. Um, so it's multi-stakeholder because it has, it's not just a, an organization of member states. It has a civil society consultative network uh, formed, uh, formed by uh, a number of civil society organizations who work on media freedom issues around the world and they provide advice on all the activities of the Media Freedom Coalition. Um, and, and one of the most important roles they play is they give uh, the member states uh, advice on specific cases of journalists at risk or media institutions at risk in countries around the globe. Um, there's the high-level uh, panel of uh, legal experts, uh, many of whom are, are sitting up here with me uh, today, um, who are an independent and diverse group of lawyers and judges who provide advice and recommendations to Media Freedom Coalition members um, with the aim of promoting and protecting a vibrant free press. And I'll speak a little bit more about the specific things, uh, help that they have uh, given the coalition. And then finally, there's uh, UNESCO is a key partner for us, and they have a global media defense fund, uh, which was set up uh, shortly after the establishment of the coalition. And it um, allows for programmatic engagement on cases and situations, for example, offering, um, offering and paying for legal assistance for journalists, um, particularly in moments of crisis. So the coalition itself has just come through a year of consolidation, um, which was, I guess, sort of brought to a head uh, two months ago in February when Estonia hosted uh, uh, in Tallinn uh, the third global conference on media freedom. So uh, over this period of consolidation, we have, um, uh, thanks to a, a bequeathal from the uh, United Kingdom, set up a secretariat which will be housed at the Thomson Reuters Foundation in London. We have a web presence thanks to Estonia. Um, and we've also been putting a, a lot more focus over this past year, something that we've consolidated, making better use of member state diplomatic networks on the ground, in particular in those countries where media freedom is most at risk. Um, it, the coalition, as I said, was founded by Canada and the United Kingdom, and we had served as the co-chairs, and then uh, the United Kingdom finished its co-chair role at the end of last year, and the Dutch have now taken over. So as co-chairs, I guess one of our, our key tasks is to give overall guidance and preside over the meetings and give direction uh, to, the, to the coalition. So what exactly do we do? I think that's a, an obvious question. Well, one of the things that we do is we uh, issue statements. We have thematic statements, for example, on World Press uh, Freedom Day. We had one recently on International Women's Day. And then we have country-focused statements that we issue. So a couple of recent examples on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the uh, assault on media freedom uh, by the Russian Federation. Uh, we've had a recent statement uh, late last year on the closure of media outlets in Hong Kong. Um, and we've had a statement on media freedom and safety of journalists in, in Myanmar. But in addition to uh, issuing statements, we also engage directly on the ground uh, um, on specific cases or, or issues of concern. Um, countries can issue um, 
local statements in a country, for example, in reaction to a trial that has taken place, um, or we can also do demarches on our own, individual members or collectively as members with uh, governments. And, and really, we see this can be a little bit more uh, productive. Uh, it depends on the uh, context, but in certain countries, quiet diplomacy can be more effective, for example, in seeing uh, journalists who are unjustly imprisoned released. It can be more effective than uh, megaphone diplomacy, but we look at both and, and we're, as we mature as an organization, we're getting a better sense of, uh, you know, when uh, it, it's good to speak loudly and when it's better to speak uh, softly. Uh, I think the key point and what I want to make for this panel is that international law is the foundation on which we engage. So you can, uh, on our website, you can look at the statements. I'm not going to say that we never um, uh, you know, resort to emotional or logical uh, appeal, but really um, the leverage that we have is because countries need to meet their international legal obligations w with regard to media freedom, but with regard to human rights uh, writ large. So Article 19 of the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also other human rights law, for example, on arbitrary detention. If you look at the recent Hong Kong statement, you will see reference to um, the need for China to respect the basic law and the Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration. Um, and, and finally, the high-level panel of legal experts um, has been doing excellent work in, in supporting the coalition. They have done, uh, issued a number of extremely uh, well-researched and comprehensive reports with specific recommendations for states on how to increase protection for media freedom uh, through new tools in the areas of sanctions, special visas, consular assistance, and investigative uh, mechanisms. So, to conclude, I'd say the coal, it's a young coalition and it, we, we do face challenges, but I think we're coming into our own based on strong partnerships and I, I guess sadly with the proliferation of uh, new phenomena such as disinformation, a growing need for the work that we're uh, trying to do around the world uh, in support of media freedom. Jeffrey, thank you very much indeed. I just want to pick up on one of the areas, um, safe refuge for journalists at, at, at risk. I mean, we identified this as a, as, as a panel um, as, a, as a real priority in the context of the safety of a journalist under the leadership of uh, Amal Clooney. It's one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time working with, including with um, Hina uh, Jilani. Um, Hina, I wondered whether you could just explain the nature of the issue and why it's an important component to protecting media freedom, this issue of safe refuge for journalists at risk. Thank you very much, Jen. <clears throat> I think it's a very good question uh, that you had, and, uh, and an important issue that you raise. Coming from Pakistan, um, I have a lot to say on this subject because uh, obviously as a human rights defender and a human rights lawyer, I have to deal with individual cases as well as you know the whole broader concept of safety for journalists in a country which is now declared as one of the most dangerous for, for um, journalists and, and for media freedom. Now you know that you know journalists have been killed, abducted, made hostage, subjected to torture and forced disappearances, put under surveillance. Uh, they have been attacked in their homes and in their places of work. Uh, their right to privacy has been violated and confidentiality of their sources has been uh, jeopardized, and their communication devices confiscated or destroyed. Now, these are many issues that have led to a situation that is extremely threatening for journalists and the work that they do. Um, now, the, the threat of harm to these journalists has risen to such a level in certain situations that many journalists are either forced to submit and, res or, and resort to self-censorship or to flee their countries and live in exile. Now, both within the country that they, they, they work and when they are able to leave when the threat um, level has risen to an extent where they can't survive in that particular environment, we need to institute um, uh, initiatives at the international level uh, so that we can give refuge to these journalists. Now, I think it's also important to understand that safety of journalists and their freedom of uh, expression is imperiled not just by the state, yeah. but also by 
non-state actors such as organized gangs, terrorist organizations, militant groups with extremist ideologies, uh, and other negative elements in the society. So this whole question of protection of journalists and safety of journalists has to be a very comprehensive and broad framework uh, that um, we can we, we need to um, abduct, uh, to um, you know adopt. Now there are two or three points that I want to make in addition to this. It's very important for somebody either at the non-state level or at the level of in, uh, at, the, at intergovernmental engagements, at the level of intergovernment uh, engagements, that we have to understand who are the journalists who are mostly at risk. Now, obviously, those are uh, those who report on politics, corruption, organized crimes, etc. Uh, the journalists who are covering war zones, areas of internal armed conflict or civil strife, foreign journalists reporting on international affairs and respect for human rights in countries where authoritarian regimes and poor rule of law observance is there. And then I think very important for me as a human rights defender are local journalists who work in remote areas, are more vulnerable because of their relative in, in, in invisibility, particularly those who report on violations of social and economic rights of rural communities by the state or by powerful national and multinational cooperation. In addition to all the risks that journalists face, we have to look at the situation of women journalists yeah. today. And they face gender-specific safety risks, such as sexual harassment, etc. And especially with this uh, digital uh, space, the, the threat to women journalists has risen to an extent where we really need to become much more sensitive. I therefore think that an, an essential aspect of the duty to protect is compliance with international um, norms and human rights and humanitarian law that are relevant to protection of journalists. And what um, you have just said, I think is very um, much linked to what I'm saying because cooperation with international initiatives established for journalist safety is very important. If we are to establish a freedom, uh, media freedom coalition, then an essential part of their thinking has to be concentrated on how do we protect these journalists, either in their national environments or even when they are living abroad, and what kind of dignified existence that they can have, which allows them to continue with their work as journalists and at the same time protects them. Thank you, Hina. And th these pathways to safety that you and I and other members of the panel have been working on, of course, have to be practical and they have to be effective. They can't just be paper. And I want to um, follow up with um, David um, McCraw. Hina Jelani um, mentioned the importance of protecting foreign journalists, but also local staff. David, I think you're going to have a perspective on this from your vantage point. Oh, th thank you so much. Uh, just to drive home how practical the, this work is. It, it, twice in the last 24 hours, uh, I've been involved in uh, moving journalists out of two separate countries because of risk. Neither of those countries were Russia or Ukraine, which has been occupying my attention. Um, th this is a real world problem. I stand in, in it's sort of the intersection of, of two work streams here. I, I am the uh, principal newsroom lawyer for the New York Times, but I also, in, in my role at the Times, am head of international security. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to me, the, the work that's being done here, that both is what has to happen in terms of the law to address the real world on the ground problems. And I, I salute the work that was done by the high level panel. If you haven't had a chance to read the report, I, I would commend it to you. It manages to talk about the real legal obstacles that journalists face when they're trying to escape danger in a country, whether they're local journalists or international journalists, um, but primarily with local journalists, and also addresses the, the, the true realities of, of trying to make that move above and beyond the law. Um, the, over the course of the summer, I and my colleagues at the, at the New York Times were deeply involved in moving people out of Afghanistan. We ended up, um, I'm happy to say, moving 215 people from Kabul uh, to Mexico City 
by way of, of Doha. Uh, most of those people have now uh, relocated to the United States or are being relocated to Canada. And I can assure you that uh, of the lesson that I took away from that, the New York Times is influential, it has resources, it threw a lot of resources at this, and it's still not enough. I can't imagine what it's like for independent journalists, local journalists working for uh, uh, local outlets in, in their country. Um, the realities of this involved, in, in my case, uh, going to the, to the State Department, to Congress, to try to get changes in the law to allow easier immigration to the United States for, for journalists from, from Afghanistan. It involved my colleagues and I negotiating with the government of, of Qatar, uh, with the government of Mexico, with Canada, high-level conversations with people in the U.S. Uh, ultimately, uh, our people in Kabul dealing directly with the Taliban. Um, and despite all that, it was still an incredible lift. And some of these things come up in the report that um, people in these emergency situations are not walking around with passports. They do not have the proper paperwork, and they're not leaving their family behind. And many, of the, many times that's small children who, again, don't have identification cards, let alone passports. And so all of those issues need to be addressed. And addressing them in country is really difficult. That's why the work that's been done by the high-level panel to talk about a more receiving culture, if you will, countries that are in the position to help, uh, taking people in and then sorting out problems with passports and visas and uh, medical checks and security checks and all that. Um, because th th those things, extremely difficult on the ground. Um, as we were, we had tried to um, have an orderly exit from Afghanistan. We had arranged for a flight uh, uh, that was going to take people to Mexico on a Monday at a night. On that Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, I received a call from an editor who said, the Taliban are walking through the streets of Kabul. I thought you might want to know. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I, yes, I did want to know. And all the well-laid plans we had as an organization fell apart and we had to scramble. Uh, it would have been so much easier had many of the things in that report already been adopted by countries in a position to help. Thank you very much, David. And I want to come back to Jeffrey immediately as the, as, as the state representative here. I mean, Jeffrey, um, majority aside, I mean, we've been working very closely with Canada on this issue. Um, Canada has also received, as have the other members of the Media Freedom Coalition, our report as a panel on safe refu refuge. Um, could you just speak to our work and what, if anything, has, has come of it? Sure. And so, I, you know, I'm pleased that Canada has actually adopted a policy um, that is, you know, aligned with the recommendation made by the uh, high-level panel. We brought in last summer a uh, specific refugee stream for human rights defenders, including uh, journalists. I, I guess a bit of a, a pilot project. Um, the numbers are modest. It's 250 uh, individuals in the first year, and that includes human rights defenders and family members. So it's not huge, and you know we always want to see bigger numbers, but you have to see uh, someplace. You have to start someplace. So that came in in the summer. Uh, I mean, it was weeks later that the Taliban uh, took over in Afghanistan. Now we have uh, Ukraine. So I, I, I think, you know, the system is is quite overwhelmed. But. Um, you know, it's a great program. It works through ref referrals from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, as well as a couple civil society organizations uh, based in Europe to do the screening. And I mean, it, it's looking at those most at risk. I, I'm not sure it must be a, a huge challenge to say who's most at risk when so many journalists and other human rights defenders are at risk. So. Um, there's that program, a, a special, I don't know, it's technically the same program, but um, there's been a renewed focus on Afghanistan and sort of independent of those numbers of 250, um, at least, I'm aware of at least one uh, group of arrivals of 170 human rights defenders from Afghanistan who arrived in Canada um, in uh, January. Um, Canada, I, I know one of the high-level panel's recommendations was for a specific uh, visa for temporary refuge. So my country, Canada, that's not something we typically do, which isn't to say that we haven't done it and which isn't to say that 
Uh, my colleagues in our immigration department are not looking very closely at doing that. But other countries um, do have longer traditions of, of doing that, in particular a number of countries in Eastern Europe. Um, my understanding is for several years, um, based on their history, have had uh, temporary refuge programs and continue to use them. Czech Republic, I, I know, is very active in this area. Germany uh, is looking at it, uh, if not doing it already. And the Netherlands, there's been a push in the Netherlands. Um, I think it started in the Dutch Parliament, um, but it sounds like things are moving forward in, in the Netherlands in that regard. Um, so the need is huge. Um, you know, listening to David uh, talk about it, the need is indeed huge and, and unfortunately getting bigger. Um, but I think we've made a, a modest uh, but positive beginning uh, in, in that regard. And ongoing work and, and discussions and dialogue with high level panel, I think will bear further fruit. Thank you very much, um, Jeffrey. I mean, it's very humbling to be with you in, uh, in Tallinn, Estonia, our first in-person in, in, in two years. And the ministers of state were all sort of addressing one another as to what they were going to be doing by way of commitment um, in the framework of the Media Freedom Coalition. And it was very humbling to hear the Czech Republic get up and say that they will be giving effect to our recommendation for an emergency visa, in Germany to follow this work in progress, but it's work that may not otherwise have come um, uh, about. Now that's just a snapshot. Um, uh, the, the sort of work that international lawyers working with states, making recommendations to them based on, as Jeffrey said, uh, firm international legal um, uh, obligation. And I should, I should make it clear there's two things I'd like to make clear at this stage based on some of the questions that have been um, coming in. Uh, the first is that this issue of safe refuge, that's just one of the areas that we've been working on. Amal Clooney has been leading the panel's work on sanctions. Owen Kotler has been leading the panel's work on bolstering consular protections for journalists that have been targeted abroad. And Nadeem Hoori, um, uh, also a member of the high-level panel, has been leading our work with our partners on the creation of an investigative task force to look into uh, abuses against journalists. One of the questions that's come in is, where does the panel sit, not via v the states it advises, but um, uh, non-governmental organizations, and whether um, there are any tensions between the panel's work, non-governmental organizations. Happy to report that of our four advisory reports, they have been endorsed formally by all of the major free speech and media freedom organizations uh, around the world. And we have been in very, very close consultation with them. They are in many respects the real experts here because we're very um, keen that whatever we provide for by way of remedy is practical and effective. But as I say, just one aspect of the role that can be played by international law, by international lawyers to safeguard freedom of the press. I want to move now to another aspect, and I want to turn to Professor uh, Dario Milo, who's been leading the panel's expert interventions before regional human rights courts on cases engaging media freedom. Professor Milo, could you speak, please, to the panel's work uh, in this area? Yeah, certainly, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, the, the major development that uh, the panel was involved in um, by invitation from the Inter-American Court um, was to submit a, an expert amicus brief in the El Universo case, which um, was winding its way through the Inter-American Court system. And just before Christmas last year, the Inter-American Court ruled. This was a case which um, involved the heart of political speech. It was uh, criticism in the form of an opinion by a journalist, a journalist working for El Universo, um, of the then president of Ecuador. So it, it really was the, the locus classicus of political speech in a democracy. And the Ecuadorian courts had sentenced the journalist and the directors of the, the publication to three years imprisonment, 30 million US dollar fine, staggering amount, and also a civil penalty of a civil um, damages of 10 million, million US dollars. So 
So really quite egregious uh, sanctions visited upon them. And in fact, the journalist uh, sought asylum in America, where I believe he currently uh, works. Um, the, as I said, the high-level panel submitted the expert amicus brief. The court ruled in uh, December last year and effectively not only endorsed the existing jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, which is essentially that there needs to be exceptional reasons for there to be criminal consequences for speech, and that's, of course, a very good proposition. But actually, we believe uh, our interpretation of the judgment is that the court went further, and the court s said, uh, as we understand it, that in the context of an opinion about a political official, a, a public official, expressed by a journalist, there is no place for criminal sanction. It will automatically be a disproportionate restriction on freedom of expression. And that certainly seems to catapult the law quite significantly forward. And the Inter-American Court um, is in quite good company here, of course, Jan, because the African courts, both the um, African Court of Human Rights, the uh, Court of Justice for West African states, the Court of Justice for East Africa, um, and in addition, the Human Rights Committee have all commented on the um, undesirability of criminal sanctions in a defamation or an insult context. So we regard this as yet a further international law nail in the criminal defamation context. Thank you very much, Professor Milo. And yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I was counsel in the Farge Gambia case, mm -hmm. and you know, this is very much a we are engaging with all regional um, human rights courts, and that Farge. Uh, case has been cited with approval now by multiple um, regional human rights courts, not only in Africa, but uh, uh, in, in <coughs> all, all around the world. Went to, I want to switch now um, from focus of litigation before international courts to litigation for um, domestic uh, courts and uh, turn to Karuna um, at Nundi. Um, Karuna, you're one of India's most prominent Supreme Court um, advocates. Could you tell us a little about the uh, Supreme Court of India's approach to international law in landmark media freedom um, cases, please? Mm, thank you, Jan. Um, so the Supreme Court has, since 1997, taken the approach that where domestic law is silent, international law may, should fill the lacuna. Um, in constitutional cases, we argue international law, we argue comparative law, but what I've found is that it's constitutional law that mostly occupies the field, and to bolster arguments, um, Comparative law, so for example, in one of the cases I argued, uh, along with other counsel, in 2005, it's still the definitive case on online free speech, um, regarding the striking down of a provision of the Information Technology Act that governs the internet, and, and what the law said, it's quite, the, the actual words are quite intriguing, that any language that was online, defined as a text message or something on a website, that was annoying or inconvenient, and I quote, could lead to a three-year prison sentence. Now, the interesting bit for the purposes of our discussion is that it was applied to a number of journalists, it was applied to bloggers, it was applied to all sorts of people, uh, which is why the constitutional challenge to the law became even more important. We submitted international law. We submitted uh, Frank LaRue's excellent report on the subject. We also submitted um, US law, and the judgment's actually particularly good on the comparison between the Indian Constitution and the US Constitution um, with regard to the freedom of expression. Um, we, you know, our Article 19 uses the words freedom of expression, but not the freedom of the press that the US Constitution does, but they sort of converge more or less, and it gives us the basis to cite some of the more progressive United States um, Supreme Court decisions as well. But the international law wasn't cited in the decision. The decision's actually very good, but the inter our international law stuff wasn't cited. Um, I think this is a bit of a problem, actually, 
because our constitutional courts are the place, really, that's the low-hanging fruit for the deepening of international law. And I think it's particularly important in the world today where countries, where you know, governments are increasingly siloed and sovereign and the effects of um, an action in the Ukraine are felt all over. Um, what Facebook does affects everyone. And I think the deepening of international law through the judiciary is vital. Now, a lot of the attacks on the freedom of the press are happening um, by state actors as well as non-state actors and are litigated in the criminal courts. Yes. And in the district courts, we almost never see international law. Um, we see some constitutional law, and not even that much, but we just sort of see black letter law interpretations of criminal procedure codes and penal codes. And I think bringing in, um, and I hope that India, India is a sort of metonym in that regard, but I think bringing in these principles is, is very, very important because of course, uh, when we look at the WGAD on arbitrary detention, the working, the working group on arbitrary detention, and when we look at um, other principles that have been laid down, sort of saying that, you, you know, look, you can't be arrested and jailed, for example, for blasphemy. You know, that's just per se bad. Um, and you can't be, you know, kept without bail for lengths of time, particularly if you're a journalist, particularly if it's in... A, um, but is, am I running out of time? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you Your know, freedom of you know, speech is being are. preserved. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, under, and I'm so delighted to be here with all of you, really. But under cover of COVID, we haven't been able to have these sorts of meetings. I mean, there's been, there's been work on, um, uh, online, of course. But I think the attacks on journalists have also benefited from that, benefited the attackers. So, um, yes, I think bringing in international law to district courts is vital. We've done a little bit of that through the work of the high level panel. I've been working on, um, um, I have a draft report that will be presented to the panel on blasphemy and religious hate speech. And based on some of that research, um, I and some others did trainings of judges across the world for an Oxford, for the Bonavera Center at Oxford. Um, and I think bringing that in to trainings and to workshops and to even more informal interactions can be one of the ways forward. Capacity building, thank you very much, um, Karina Nundi. I want to now, we're talking about strategic litigation um, uh, in, 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 in one respect. Often when one talks about strategic litigation in this context, it is litigation that is being brought to give effect to rights, to protect journalists. But unfortunately, in the last five um, or so years, um, there's been the emergence of strategic litigation that is being commenced actually to shut journalism down. This is a critical issue for all of us working in the field. I want to turn back now to um, Professor Milo Slaps. Now, um, some of you may know um, what um, Slaps stand for. Um, some of you will not yet. I have three questions for you, Professor Milo. What are Slaps? How do they work? And why do they pose a threat to media freedom? Thank you, Jan. And this time, the acronym is, is actually pretty useful because it stands for strategic lawsuits against public participation or strategic litigation against public participation. And this time, as you say, the strategic thinking is on the part of the plaintiff or the claimant who uh, intends to, the ulterior motive, is not to vindicate their reputation because often these do arise in defamation contexts, though not always. That's not the objective. And of course, that should be the objective of, a, of, of an aggrieved a deserving plaintiff. Instead, the objective of these ty types of claimants or plaintiffs is to intimidate, to harass, to censor, to free speech, chill speech, um, to render you speechless for criticizing the plaintiff. 
The plaintiff could be a multinational corporation. We often see that. It could also be a very powerful politician or businessman. So the, I believe we had an inflection point now. Um, it's almost a perfect storm, a good storm, in the international uh, and regional world at the moment, in the ecosystem, because just two weeks ago, for instance, the European Court for Human Rights, for the first time, used SLAP methodology to decide a case where um, a Russian organ of state had sued um, an online publication for um, a retraction in relation to false statement, allegedly false statements that were made, which were in fact comments about the Russian organ of state. And the European Court for Human Rights, in the context fairly unusually of finding that th there was no legitimate aim mm -hmm. that justified the, um, the forced retraction that the courts had ordered, the European Court said this was essentially a slap and endorsed that um, thinking and that terminology. And actually in the Al Universo case, which I discussed in the context of criminal defamation, it was also interesting, I think for the first time, as far as I know, that the Inter-American Court used slap methodology to categorize, and remember that context being the president suing a journalist for a, a comment made about their conduct. So I believe we're not at an inflection point internationally. Domestically, in a, in a number of jurisdictions, you will also have seen developments. In the UK, there are, um, there's a, a study um, where the government there has called for evidence of slaps, and the intention certainly seems to be to amend the Defamation Act to take in, this into account, apparently triggered by um, libel lawsuits by Russian oligarchs. Um, in my country, South Africa, uh, we argued a case in February where we sought to have developed under common law a defense to slaps. So we don't have legislation on slaps, but we said to the constitutional court, you can develop this as a species of your abuse of process jurisdiction. And um, hopefully that judgment will come out in the next few months and um, um, also I think gives um, inspiration, should give inspiration to um, similar jurisdictions where you don't have legislation, but you can perhaps turn to procedural law to, um, to address this, this uh, problem. So, uh, yeah, I think um, from the high-level panel point of view, obviously we are very interested in this issue. There's a, a report that um, Prof Webb is in the audience and myself and um, others have been involved in where one of the aspects is SLAPS. Um, we, I was um, an a, uh, advisor to the EU Commission, which is looking at this. Um, the Council of Europe has now started an expert advisory process. So I think we'll see massive developments in years to come. And, you know, it seems to me, as I said when I addressed the UK anti slap um, conference last year for the panel. It seems to me that it takes a village to, fi to fight a slap, and um, the panel is very happy to be a resident of that village. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Milo. It's absolute um, priority um, uh, for us now. I want to ask David McGraw about his perspective on this from a sort of newsroom um, um, uh, perspective. Um, as, as many of you know, in the United States, it's a, a bit of an ex experiment. It's a bit of a laboratory for anti-slap law. There, there are statutes in many states, but not all states. And, and of course, in the, in the United States, those additional protections where someone can make an anti-slap motion to challenge uh, at an early stage whether a, a case is being brought simply to, to silence uh, is layered on top of Times versus Sullivan and is layered on top of the United States in, in libel cases that the plaintiff has the burden of, of proving falsity, the publisher doesn't have the burden of proving truth. So um, I think many people look at it as we've put another layer of icing on a very, very fine cake already. Um, but the, the, the experience has been that um, from, from an international perspective, having a, a European solution makes a lot of sense. The, the reality is that all publishing is global. Um, as a practical matter, it's very hard to geofilter. It's not impossible, but every time I've been involved with it, it's very difficult because stories find their way into a jurisdiction no matter what you as the publisher do if it's available someplace because of email, because of people stealing it, violating our copyright and putting it up, because it goes on LexisNexis, not just on the, the, the website. And also, geofiltering um, it, it poses a sobering reality that the, are, are you really going to say that we're, we're, okay, the Chinese don't like that story, we won't bother them anymore, we will not, not run it there. 
that the part of the strength, the power, the influence of the Internet is that we are global publishers and that we want to reach audiences. In many of these cases, it's that audience that we want to reach where there is the threat of, of a lawsuit. What I would say uh, about SLAP and, and the way it works in most U.S. states is, is, is you kind of think of it in three ways. One is that um, the plaintiff bringing the case needs to show that there is a substantial basis in law and fact. Uh, that is going to be second. That's going to be decided at a preliminary stage with the hopes of, of stopping the litigation early. And in most states, there is a fee shift, unusual in the United States, where uh, if the plaintiff loses uh, um, on the anti-slap motion, uh, uh, the defendant is entitled to, uh, the defendant publisher is entitled to fees. But the real strength of this and the real value of it for freedom of expression is that does it serve as a disincentive to litigation? If you're really talking about oligarchs, uh, big corporations, people with resources, it's simply a financial calculation. They bring the lawsuit and they lose. They may have proved their point, spent some money doing it, but proved their point. The, the, the real value of these kind of statutes is the degree to which they prevent the threat before publication of, a, of that of a lawsuit, and they serve as a disincentive, disincentive afterwards. And I think that requires some calibration as the statutes get written, how you actually get there. The last thing I'd say is that there is some resistance in courts where what they see is a David and Goliath problem because um, an individual can sue an organization like the New York Times. We can make an anti-slap motion. Many times a judge is going to say, this looks like David and Goliath. <laughs> a big corporation has yet another tool. But I think calibrating it to address fairness issues is important. But ultimately, um, when it is used to stop lawsuits, where is, uh, as, as was brought up earlier by, by Dario, it's not really about reputation, it's about silencing. These kind of statutes are really important. David, thank you very much um, indeed. We have um, 10 or so minutes left. I just want us all, you've heard a lot from us, I want to take a, a, a step back and just recall, I remember when the Media Freedom Coalition was created in um, 2019, was the summer, pre-COVID. And I remember um, Christina Freeland on behalf of Canada, uh, Jeremy Hunt, then Foreign Secretary on behalf of the United Kingdom, sharing a stage with um, uh, Amal um, Clooney. And I just remember um, Amal's comments that the international system of protection, um, media freedom, was broken in some respects, and that this initiative uh, on the part of the Media Freedom Coalition had to be about um, uh, applying new fixes. Um, two years on after COVID, I want to revisit that question. I want to turn to Hina um, uh, Jelani. Um, Hina, if you were to identify one area in this context, in terms of the international framework, protecting media um, uh, freedom. Where would you say it is most broken and in urgent uh, need of attention? You know, I wouldn't go as far as saying that it's broken, but there is certainly something that we need to do in order to make sure that international standards are firstly followed in national laws because it's there that actual things have to happen. International law just uh, enunciates the principles and the standards. But when uh, national law is either not um, um, incorporating those standards or, in fact, not implementing laws that recently we have seen good laws come in, but they, their implementation is short of, any, uh, of demonstrating any commitment to preserve the same value system on which rests the respect for media freedom. So I think that th that far I would say uh, it needs to be fixed. And I'll point out a few uh, areas which in, in particular specific areas as a practicing lawyer I feel um, difficulty with. Now I think that um, one of the uh, issues is where governments have used um, counterterrorism laws, national security, et cetera, 
to raise an alarm about national security to an extent where international standards, they think it's justified to uh, set them aside. And uh, national um, and domestic courts have many times allowed this to happen, including in my country. And I've seen that in India also, which we look towards the Indian Supreme Court uh, um, in the region, we think that they can do a better job than they have done in certain recent, uh, recent judgments. So I, I, I believe that this whole question of security overcoming international standards globally has to be in many ways uh, set aside. Secondly, I think um, the other thing is, you know, um, ICCPR Article 19, and you've all discussed this just now with regard to criminal defamation. It says to protect the reputation of others. Mm -hmm. Now I know that jurisprudence is, being, is evolving on this from the Human Rights Committee and other sources, but at the same time there has to be a very authoritative uh, interpretation of that particular uh, ground that the ICCPR gives, because we are having a lot of trouble um, in, I've recently lost a case where I had challenged a provision of the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act in Pakistan where um, false uh, or fake news is now considered to be defamatory and, uh, uh, you know, the, it has been used against journalists, human rights defenders, and, and social commentators in general. So I, <clears throat> I think these are some of the areas in which we need to look at. Slaps is another problem. <coughs> And uh, we have seen slaps being used for political comment, et cetera. But imagine, in my country, slaps is being used against the Me Too, Me Too movement. Yeah. And it's criminal defamation that we are worried about. I think that uh, defamation, if it has to remain, it's fine if it is uh, restricted to the domain of civil law. But criminal defamation has to go. And I'm afraid that the Human Rights Committee, even in its comment, has not given that uh, think uh, authority uh, with, with sufficient authority to convince um, national courts that this is a value that we must preserve as well. So these are some of the areas I think that um, uh, we need to um, look at. Uh, and then the other issue I think is also this media concentration, yeah. where plural media is being denied uh, existence because of the fact that there are so many vested interests now being created with media concentration in the hands of big media houses. And this has an indirect impact on uh, journalistic freedom also, because journalists are now depending a lot on policy of media houses and using self-criticism, uh, uh, self-censorship. Um, so I think these are some of the issues that uh, need to be looked at with regard to international law, its implementation, the way that it is applied, and the sources that interpret international law and how they are to interpret it, keeping in mind the national situation of journalists and media freedom and how they can overcome the challenges to that in the national and domestic domains. Thank you very much, Ina. I mean, media concentration and the other aspect to it, of course, is governments coming in and media changing hands um, uh, overnight, um, giving rise to issues of accreditation, licensing. I just recall uh, the most um, um, popular um, network in the Philippines, ABS-CBN, turning off overnight. Uh, absolutely remarkable, um, the uh, impact that that sort of government indirect action can have. Uh, Karin Nundi, I want to pose the same question um, to you about the broken system and areas that require immediate uh, attention. I guess human life, I think, Jan. Um, I think getting the journalist out yeah. to safe refuge is, is one of the most important things, but also mm -hmm. doing it in a way that is fast, yeah. and that's also allows for a life in journalism elsewhere. Yes. And I think the latter is something yes. that's quite important because um, Jan's uh, uh, report on behalf of the panel says that I think it's 17% of journalists that continue work as journalists in other parts of the world when they do at least have their lives 
um, safeguarded. And I think the more countries that sign up to providing these sorts of emergency visas and, and um, proper resettlement, the, the greater the choice. Maybe there'll be a community that speaks the particular language in which the journalist is used to reporting in. I think there's another challenge, and that's more doctrinal, but we do have a lot of smart people um, on this panel and in the room. When you have prosecutions against journalists that are ancillary for a purported violation of tax law, for example, right? And that's happening more and more and more. Um, I think it would be particularly useful for international law mechanisms to be able to go into that rather than just saying, oh, that's due process and let's see what happens in the end. Because so-called due process has a massive chilling effect. It can result in denial of visas to other countries. It can result in denial to, of, of reporting, reportage, entry into particular fora. Um, and it can also you know, result in bail, uh, uh, jail without bail for many, many, many years. Um, and I think that's something we've got to wrap our heads around and maybe, maybe look at, and it, it's always a bandwidth problem in international law, but maybe have um, um, funding for particular, for even the, a subcommittee of the Human Rights Committee or our panel perhaps. I mean, we've sort of a little bit discussed this, but not properly, um, to look at individual cases, go into them in depth and say that, you know, this is a pile of rubbish and give strength and voice to the journalists, but also their advocates in the particular country. Karina, that's, that's, that's a terrific point on, um, you know, other measures taken by state short of um, direct targeting tax, taxes. One, I mean, I, I note the European Court of Human Rights in the last three or four years, it's really bolstering its Article 18 jurisprudence on this and going into areas that it was not been happy to go into previously. I think regional human rights courts are really going to have to grapple uh, with this and look at state intention in a way that they haven't um, before. Um, we have run out of time, um, so it just falls on me to, th to, to thank all of my uh, co-panelists for um, coming in, to thank you all for joining us, and perhaps we could provide a round of applause for our panel. Thank you.